than your own organization. Um, I'm joined by three fabulous speakers, all of whom have loads of experience in this area. Um, so I'd like to introduce to you first, Tom Hughes, Head of Risk and Financial Crime at Simply Health. Hi, Tom. Hi, yeah. See you. Hi. Claire Hopper, Sales Engineer at Risk Connect. Hi, Claire. Hi, Claire. And Alex Sidorenko, Group Head of Risk, Insurance and Internal Audit at Sierra Verde. Um, first, Hi, Hey, so perhaps if first you can explain a little bit about who you are and what your role is. Um, Alex, could you kick us off? Um, sure. Well, I mean, it's um, it's pretty much in the name. I look after the risk management function, the integration of quantitative risk analysis into decision making, uh, the application of risk analysis and insurance, and then uh, linking that to the internal audit plan uh, for um, uh, for for a group of companies which uh, focuses on uh, mining rare earth and our main asset is in uh, Brazil. Lovely, thank you, Claire. Perhaps you could just give a quick introduction to yourself as well. Yeah, hi everyone. So uh, my role at Risk Connect is as a sales engineer, but previously I was a trainer for quite a few years, and that included training clients on embedding their framework into using a system with us. Uh, but actually, I used to also train our internal new starters on GRC and the terminology there, which I think applies a little bit to this risk culture uh, today. So looking forward to sharing some of that with you guys. Lovely. Thank you. And Tom, you next, if you can just talk a little bit about your role. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, thank you. So Tom Hughes, yeah, Head of Risk and Financial Crime at Simply Health. Um, prior to that, um, uh, various uh, various insurance companies within their second line second line functions, and really responsible for all things enterprise risk and financial crime, but primarily fraud. Great, thank you. And I'm going to come straight back to you, Tom. Can you start by perhaps giving us an example of where positive risk culture within an organisation you've worked for, so perhaps Simply Health, has led to better decision making? Yeah, sure. So first of all, I think I've been really lucky to work in businesses where people want to do the right thing, the right thing, which is really important for this culture. And in my current organisation, we've got a, a very positive risk culture in many ways. So that's really driven by being purpose led. So with a, a purpose to provide affordable access to healthcare for all in the UK. And I, th I think another thing that helps there is the way that we're set up, because we're not private equity owned, we don't have shareholders, means that where a lot of companies are really motivated towards that release in dividends, instead we can really focus on how we make a, a sustainable profit that we can reinvest into health solutions for customers. Um, but in terms of transformation of risk culture, I've also worked in environments where the risk culture is maybe not as clearly defined. Um, and there isn't necessarily the same level of understanding, visibility and transparency that you might look for. Um, and that could be for a variety of reasons. It might be the people you've got in place. It might be the proportionality of the framework you're trying to introduce in that stage of maturity. It might be the trust that the business has in your, your risk function. So in this example, um, where it wasn't as mature as it could have been, uh, we really had to go back to the basics and look at how could we reset the risk management framework? How could we transition hearts and minds so that risks are understood, so that they're actively managed and that the risk management function as a whole is trusted to play an active and collaborative role. So that, that was what we did to achieve. And the outcome of achieving that is that risk really becomes a commercial enabler um, rather than a, a kind of a last minute blocker as it can be seen to be. Um, so you're, you're kind of evaluating the purpose of an activity, you're evaluating its alignment to the business's strategic goals and making it really clear that you're, you're helping to, um, to like remove boulders that could get in the way of success. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Claire, you know, you mentioned you work with a lot of organisations in this kind of area. Can you give some examples perhaps of where clients have managed to improve decision making through better risk culture and how? That's yeah, worked? definitely. I think one very similar to what Tom mentioned, like a common thing is that terminology. Like once you have a system in place or your framework in place, you want to spread that word across people and help people use um, a system or just any documents that you have where you're asking them for data so that they can share their experience with you because they have the knowledge in their areas, you know. So I don't think a risk manager can be aware of all risks that might impact an organization. You need to use people to be able to get that data in. And I, I think one thing I commonly see is people to kind of trying to raise the um, opportunity to raise incidents. So all employees can raise incidents in an organization and then once that data is coming through, then people can use that data to see key themes, think about emerging risks that might be coming into the organization. Um, what cost effective controls do we have in place? And we can compare the cost of incidents with the cost of controls that we put in place and 
see the differences there and really start to share that back to everybody else to see what influence they've had um, on helping the organization meet their objectives. So again, just like Tom said, like sharing those business objectives and goals with everyone is really the key. It's not starting with what risks we want to look at, it's starting with that business objective. Lovely. Alex, I know this is a, a keen interest of yours. You know, how, how can you give some examples of how you've managed to um, use risk culture to kind of really improve decision making throughout an organization? That was, so in my mind, a sign of a very positive and strong culture is when a business, before making an important decision, calls you and asks you for your either methodology or quantification support um, to do the risk analysis for that specific decision. And one thing kind of stands out in my memory, and it was a while back, uh, but it was, uh, it was quite vivid. Um, we were just th this was back in the day uh, more than 10 years ago when we stopped forever using heat maps and moved to quantitative risk analysis and building proper models and uh, um, i remember we were kind of going across the company promoting uh, the use of quantitative risk analysis. It, it required a lot more effort from the team and i remember one team kind of being passionate and motivated enough to reach out and say you know can I, can you help us we feel we feel alarmed about one of our subsidiaries and it was a, a solar generation subsidiary um, and so we've run a few simulations, few stress tests on the business plan for, for the company. And all of our simulations showed exactly the same message that the company was going to go bankrupt either in five months or seven months. Uh, and that was a multi-billion dollar company uh, back, back, back in the day. And, and I remember writing up the, the, the little summary of our analysis and sending it to the CEO and then reading in the news the following day how the CEO went to speak to the deputy energy minister and then within six months, uh, one of the conclusions from the risk analysis was that uh, um, the legislation, the current federal legislation they, for uh, solar generation tariffs uh, would bankrupt the company because the interest rates were going up. The foreign exchange was extremely volatile and there was a lot of operational uh, risk, which, which wasn't accounted for in the legislation. Uh, so anyway, within six months, they ended up changing the legislation. So it was kind of, the, and the company is still alive. Um, it should have you know, been bankrupt uh, 10 years ago. Um, uh, the company is still alive, and th that was that was an amazing kind of experience when somebody um, absorbed that culture and was motivated enough to try something new, try risk analysis, quantitative risk analysis, to support the decision they were making. Uh, so that that kind of that really stands out in my memory until now. Great, thank you. Um... So I'm going to come to you first on this next one. So thinking about some of the examples we've had, the example that you gave, can you talk us through some of the practical steps that your clients have taken to positively influence the culture and achieve these kind of better decision making? So what are the what's the roadmap to getting there? Yeah, sure. I think I mean, I see this across different organizations, different industries. And I think, again, starting with your framework, you know, we see a lot of documentations that people share with us before they get a system saying like, you know, we've thought a lot about this framework and we want to use a system to be able to implement it. So I would, you know, I can't speak for them, but I imagine that that was definitely a good first step is aligning the terminology um, from a personal experience and teaching, you know, new employees at RiskConnect, the terminology that we use, the acronyms that we use, I would definitely advise, you know, thinking about having a glossary of those terms before you go speaking to people, um, help them understand kind of what risk means to you as well. So take those steps initially, engage the organization. Um, and then having a system in place is obviously going to be my bias, my advice, because you can get some really consistency in your data. Um, you know, people might have different ways that they want to articulate an incident or a control or a risk, and they might have different data that they do genuinely need to store because it's in a different area but actually with once it's in a system it is still stored in places where it's easy to report on so you can see the similarities you can see the differences and then the next step then is to obviously review that data look for commonalities think about more that risk language again like how are people are taking articulating risk what teams are doing well you know like look for those that have really good controls in place um, that they're testing, that they're assessing, um, and speak to them and think about how that might be used in another area of the business as well. So I, I do see a lot of clients starting with the mature area, um, often is like an IT team or something like that, because they're naturally, whether they know it or not, mitigating risk all the time. Um, and they often have a lot of knowledge to share with people. So 
yeah, maybe starting in one department if you're not really sure where to go um, and thinking about that. Alex, um, getting everybody on board with proper quantitative risk analysis, no mean feat. So what were some of the steps that you took to do that? And what are some of the steps that, that risk managers can take more generally to achieve better decision making? Very positive. So, so, so my, my experience is twofold. One is fun. One is uh, one is real. Uh, for, for the fun part, the surprisingly, the biggest thing that we've done is, is the risk team, which just made huge positive impact. Uh, we created an after hours uh, beer drinking, pizza eating, table tennis tournament. Um, in fact, it was so successful that um, uh, heads of departments complained when I wouldn't visit and talk to them for a while. That like, like oh, why are you avoiding us? Uh, and in fact, it was so successful that the company turned it into a corporate sport and entered a corporate champions league for table tennis. And I think they got like third place in the in the in the city uh, at some stage. And it, it just started for me as a, as a reason to have this um, informal interaction with all of the heads of the departments and their teams uh, and just talk about risk um, kind of you know, with the beer. Um, that's on the fun side. But on the serious side, um, the, the thing that makes the biggest difference or made, sorry, that made the biggest difference in my experience is making risk analysis inevitable. Uh, and uh, that means rewriting procurement procedures, investment procedures, budgeting procedures that basically says you cannot go ahead with the budget. You cannot present it for approval unless it has you know, stress tests or simulations incorporated. You have to present uh, NPVs as P90. And anybody who knows what P90 is knows that you can't get that without uh, doing proper risk analysis. You're like, you can't get a P90 from a heat map. Um, and um, and uh, just making it so inevitable, uh, almost to a degree where block certain uh, decisions to be presented to the board or to the executive committee unless it has proper risk analysis. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's fun on, so on one side, and it's making risk management proper quantitative risk management um, inevitable, unavoidable. Um, and uh, kind of consistent across uh, key business uh, decisions. Lovely. Tom, coming to you next, you know, what do you think are some of the key steps that risk managers can take to, to, to achieve better decision making through positive culture? Yeah, I mean, that first, I love Alex's example there, by the way, and I think that might be something we'll, uh, we'll try and uh, spin up in our place too, actually. Um, but um, but I, I think there's two main elements for, for my side too, actually, on, on the one hand, building fantastic relationships is so important and not to be um, underestimated at all. Um, I'll, I'll probably keep coming back to this, to be honest, as well, because, you know, if you build really great relationships with the people that you work with, you can really build up that trust to the point where, you know, they want to come to you. They feel like they're in a safe environment where they can raise things with you. It's it's not um, it's not a fear of blame or anything um, along those kind of lines. Um, I, mean, I do think you've got to be quite strategic in how you do it at the same time, right? So, um, you know, it goes through multiple layers of the business from um, from the board risk appetite to um, how that plays through your go and how that goes through your organisation. And, um, and they, you're going to play that at different layers, right? So I think one of the most powerful things that we've done is to embed... Um, well, first of all, to identify what your key risks are and to Claire's point, to come up with a really clear, well understood taxonomy that people recognise. And, and I think you know when that's going well, when people start to, to play that language back at you as well. Um, so I've had times when I've been in, in risk, um, business partnering meetings and people have been using the language that's in our risk registers and our risk reporting back to us. And that's a really good sign of success, I think. Um, but also in things like workshops. So, for example, um, we have a a, a commercial awareness course and a strategic thinking course. And at the end of those courses, there's a, a session with either me or one of my team where we try and really bring it to life with the group in a really engaging way, right? People come into the session thinking, oh God, here we go, it's a, an hour and a half of risk or whatever, and it's gonna be really dry. But we have a, a very engaging session, a very interactive session where we talk about some real life examples of risk management. Um, we, we bring the strategy of the business to life. You know, we pull out some some key elements and some key risks of there. We do some low time modeling as well. That's always fun, isn't it? Some some causes and consequences and such like, and, and maybe bring in a bit about you know how might we control that. And these are normally with people who are um, maybe not necessarily engaging with your risk registers so often. They might be more the middle layer of the organisation that can can often be forgotten. I think, um, and it gets them thinking a little bit outside their silo, uh, thinking about you know what how other areas might impact what they do, but also how the things that they do actually do typically manage risk. And again, that goes down 
through the layers too. So um, we, uh, I say enforced, maybe that's the wrong word, but we, we at least mandated that everyone should have a risk-based objective in their personal development plan, which sounds like a really challenging thing to do. But the moment you actually start thinking about their objectives anyway, most of them are managing a risk of some sort. So it could be quality, it could be you know helping to achieve a sales target. But when you start pinning that as closer to the strategic objectives of the business, like everything they're doing is managing risk. So having a really strategic and um, approach to how you tackle each of those layers is kind of how we went about it. Lovely, thank you. Before I come on to my next question, just a reminder that we will be taking audience questions. We're happy to do so. And you can either post them in the chat or you can post them in the Q&A section and I will put them to our panelists in a little bit. Um, Alex, coming to you, thinking about this kind of um, risk journey that you've been on in, in the organizations you've worked with, what are some of the challenges or barriers that, that you've come up against or that risk managers may come up against when doing these sorts of things? Um, and how did you go about overcoming them? Uh, so so when, I, when I think about the challenges, I think of two things. Um, one is um, be because humans are so kind of entrenched in, um, in the biases and heuristics and personal hidden motivations. And um, uh, so, some people are just not, not nice. Um, you, you really never know what will work. So to me, culture was always um, a, a, a situation with like a million drops. Imagine uh, you know, uh, watering your flowers with just many, many uh, random initiatives uh, trying to figure out which one will work. So uh, risk culture is not, you know, it's it's not it's not a training uh, once once a quarter, once a year. It's it's like twenty different small things that individually may mean nothing, but together they kind of you know, influence that that culture. So I, I literally have a plan, risk culture plan um, that has many 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 specific uh, small, sometimes insignificant actions. Uh, that's. That, that, that's one thing. Uh, and then uh, the, the other challenge, the other humongous challenge is that uh, once you start um, adjusting decisions or objectives or performance uh, through the lens of res risk, you see that some of the things that are um, marketed as positive are not so positive. For example, you know, we made a lot of volume on the product or we made a lot of money, but we also absorbed a lot of risk. Uh, uh, the success comes at the cost and um, um, kind of not, not downgrading, but uh, uh, adjusting people's performance, their bonuses, uh, their sal salary payments uh, based on the risk they actually take for the shareholders um, is something they don't take lightly. Apparently, they um, they feel pretty precious uh, about uh, uh, about being remunerated for the fair amount of risk uh, that they take and uh, they also sometimes think that risk is unlimited. You can take as much as you like, uh, which is obviously not the case. Risk capital is quite a limited capacity. Um, so the two challenges are, is always kind of juggling with many balls as the risk manager, trying to find what, what will make a difference. Um, and the second one kind of you know, swimming against the current of human nature of ignoring risk and not wanting to be accountable for the risk that they take. Perfect. Tom, what's your view on sort of key challenges you faced or you think are likely to be faced and how they might be tackled? Yeah, sure. So look, I think one of the challenges is that, is that every, everyone you're dealing with is different. Right? There's a lot of people coming in and out of the business as well who might have come from different risk cultures too, which uh, might take a, a little bit of, um, of adapting as well when you get in. And, uh, and they all have different motivations. They all have different appetites and awareness of risk. As well, generally. So, you know, if I think about when we implemented our um, our GRC solution, which incidentally is Risk Connect, right? So uh, we quickly realised who who our stakeholders are, things like you know how what's their attitude towards risk, uh, what's their what's their history on it, how busy are they, how technologically adept are they, how likely are they to embrace the kind of change that we're looking to introduce introduce as well. And this kind of helped us to to um, flex our approach. So you know, people who are more likely to um, adopt the solution at speed, um, we could give them a little bit less focus than those who necessarily needed a little bit more sort of hand-holding as opposed to it, um, with some of those you're, you're really um, influencing them to try and build them into the kind of risk culture that you're looking to to adopt through selling the, the benefits of it. So, you know, one of the things is, um, you know, if having that transparency and that awareness and that, that um, 
uh, ability to raise risk is going to give you the mechanism to bring something to the table you might not have been able to get traction on without it, right? So we might be able to come in and be that commercial enabler, help to move that boulder that I talked about earlier um, and to get that out of the way. Um, there's, there's going to be times when you still need to put your foot down on things, but you know, again, it's if you're understanding those uh, those relationships, you're going to have a, a much better time of doing it. So, it's, again, it's a bit like the kind of the agile manifesto. It's about individuals and interactions for me over sort of processes and tools. Now, with either your training hat on or your client hat on, what do you see as some of the kind of challenges and how you've seen people successfully tackle them? I think when it comes to risk culture, I think the obvious answers are ones that Alex and Tom gave. It's just people and their engagement with risk. Um, obviously, there's going to be other challenges that come across the way. But one thing that we see quite often is, um, you know, people have learned risk management from different sources and different, um, I don't know, I'm sure later today we're going to advise like different books, different YouTube channels, things like that. And then they often do have similar messaging, but often that messaging is delivered in different ways and I think that's absolutely fine it's, tr it's tr trying to use that to what matters to you as an organization um, and it, just trying to articulate a message that everyone does feel like the whole company is on board with and um, that way that it doesn't come down to an individual's opinion necessarily and it's something that can be carried across as people leave or move jobs um, yeah but it's hard for me to kind of add much more than Tom and Alex because I think they, they got it right there. Okay, I'm going to pivot to some audience questions. There have been loads. Um, so I'm going to group three of them together because they're all broadly on the same topic. So one person said, how to embed risk culture in practice? Doesn't this start with tone from the top? If management does not ask about main threats to performance and what teams are doing about them as a prerequisite to approving, then it's an uphill battle for, for risk teams. And then a couple of other people have managed tone from the top. So I think somebody said, how better to engage top management and improve the tone of the top of the organization? And someone else said, what about buy-in from senior management. So three questions on tone for the top, senior manager buy-in, who'd like to go first? <laughs> Alex, I'm gonna pick on you. Do, do you want to, Tom? Oh, um, I'm happy. Go ahead. Tom. Okay, uh, okay, so I mean, I don't I don't really understand what the question is um, because uh, the risk culture is a million things done simultaneously. And engaging top management is obviously one of them. Uh, they, uh, you know, I had a joke with uh, our uh, our CFO. Uh, we embed risk culture not with the executive, but uh, despite the executive. <laughs> uh, it means that there will always be someone who will be aggressively against any type of risk analysis, any type of risk integration. And who cares? You just kind of you just uh, embed risk uh, culture in all the other parts of the organization. Um, and, and so, uh, to, to, uh, 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 from the top, I mean, sure, uh, I mean, it, it's it's kind of a given. You you have to start with somebody at the executive. Uh, truth be told, you probably need just one um, to be uh, to be successful. And what I also found is that sometimes you don't even need that. Um, if you find, I found it's much easier to speak with director level as opposed to like vice president level. And once the directors kind of fully bought into the fact that we need to do proper risk analysis for the decisions that they want to bring to the board uh, for the approval, um, and they've done all the work, the vice presidents usually don't really block it. They kind of, they, they, they go along with it. So that there are so many ways to, you know, slice the cat uh, that um, pretty much anything you can think of will probably work if your end game is to change how decisions are made within the organization and to support the decisions with proper you know, quantitative risk analysis. Um, how you achieve that, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much up to you. Know, up to you. For example, I, I obviously am a little bit more aggressive than your average person. And so I have get this whole notion of risk management one, risk management two, you know, risk management for the regulators, risk management for us internally. I literally call it us versus them. And um, uh, some executives buy into that message, others don't. And I find other you know, things uh, that they buy into. Um, but it, you, you know what really helps with buy-in for risk management is saving a lot of millions of dollars. Because once you save a few millions of dollars, it's, it's a lot easier to sell risk management. And this is kind of, this is what I usually focus on first. Uh, once you save a few million on insurance, uh, the buy-in from the top seems to be a lot easier after that. 
I was going to add to what Alex said now. Sorry, Tom, for cutting in for me. So yeah. just because on that point, I would I was always going to say about thinking about the uncertainty of opportunities. Don't forget that risk is not just about threats to the organization. It's about opportunities, too. And if you can start showing that as a money making exercise, then again, the board will be more interested in that as well so um, and we don't see that very often I think like everyone starts threat that's fine it's reactive it's what we need to do but once you start identifying those uh, causes uh, in your very time model you can start thinking about how that could be have a positive influence on your organization and meeting those objectives and you know someone just asked in the chat then about the positive impacts post-covid so you know there's so many businesses out there that have actually done really well from covid uh, from the way that they've reacted to that uncertain event so yes we could learn from that and and yeah engage the, the board more there great tom yeah thank you um so look, i mean I'd, the only thing I'd, I'd kind of add to any of that is that um um, you know, think about who your allies are as well. So it, it's a bit of a two-way street, I mean, at the same time. So, you know, I choose to work in, in the organisation I'm in. I chose to work in the organisations I was in before. Um, and if I find an organisation that just fundamentally will not shift its risk culture or I can't get comfortable with it, I just won't work in it. Right? It's as simple as that. Um, but, um, but, you know, if, if you're looking to improve it, then sometimes it's a case of seeing who, who your allies are. Um, you don't necessarily always want to be the person who's kind of bringing the stuff to the table. Um, it might be that you've got a I don't know a chief technology officer who, who really resonates with what you're you're saying and you know influencing them to the point that they're bringing it to the table and you're backing them up is often a, a good thing to do so you're not just seen as the guy who's who's blocking everything so I'd say you know work out who your allies are who the people are that you can trust how you can position some of them to support you in in what you're looking to achieve. Okay, great. I'm going to try and group together some more questions. There are a lot of questions. Um, so there's some questions on sort of the sustainability of risk culture um, and and some of the questions include kind of um, what's the best framework to identify the elements composing a risk culture and ask about COSO2 and then there's something about um, how vital is a risk plan or program to sustain risk culture and responding to what Claire mentioned about COVID, you know, once you have those wins, how do you share them back to management? Do you put them alongside the risk register? So kind of, I guess it's once you've kicked off, like what are some of the, how do you then sustain this and how do you make sure you're thinking about the right things and how do you make sure that you understand what good risk culture looks like and that's what you're aiming for? Um, Tom, I'm going to come to you first this time. Well, I'm not in there. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's all right. Um, but uh, how to kind of keep it alive and keep it keep it sustainable is is kind of what I'm what I'm hearing there. Um, and through continuous revision, I mean, look, I mean, you've you've got um, ways of keeping things up to date. And the COSO question is interesting. I mean, we don't necessarily um, conform with any particular um, model or standard while we sort of influenced by them. But I think you know you've got to you've got to make it fit for the business that you're in. So like Alex and I work in very different um, different organisations, and, and I'm sure our approaches are very different. But they're probably the right fit for, for both the business and the stage of maturity that those businesses are, are in right now. So, um, so you want to have a sustainable model by reevaluating where you are, how effective it is, you know, is are you seeing the kind of risk culture that you're looking for, the kind of awareness and preferences throughout your organization that you're that you're hoping to see and just continually revisiting it and you know ask feedback as well. So um those those key stakeholders that you engage with, the ones that are um that are willing, the ones that are resistant, you know, don't be afraid to hear it from them, uh, hear what's working, um, and um, and make sure that it keeps being aligned to, to the um, the objectives of the business, right? Because they, they'll change. Um, so why shouldn't your risk management framework change with it? Yeah, great. Claire? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm going to use my training cat here. It's like, what it's never ever one and done when you're training somebody. Like, and don't forget to start from the beginning as well. When you are training people again or touching base a year later, there'll be new employees in your organization. There'll be people in different, there'll be different environmental impacts that will be impact, affecting your organization at the time. So, you know, don't be afraid, don't presume everybody does know the business objectives, presume everyone understands what the risk terminology is, you know, start from the beginning every time, start the first 10 minutes, you will disengage people that do know it already, and I understand that, but just explain why you're, you know, starting from the beginning every time you have those chats. Um, I think that's really important that you, you will, unfortunately, really have people 
nod and agree when they actually don't know what you're talking about otherwise um and i get that a lot in training i would have people that when i started i'm not shy i ask when i don't know the meanings of things and i used to work in an organization that um supported people on having alcohol and drug testing policies and procedures in their organization however i did not know the definition of a control i did not know the definition of mitigation and yet that's what i was supporting clients to do it, terminology isn't it is everything but it, it because everyone should be aligned in what it means but it doesn't mean people don't know risk management when they don't understand the words that you're using so start afresh help people understand uh, that they do understand risk management and they're probably already doing it um and yeah and really just don't forget that people might be a bit shy and letting you know that they don't understand what you're saying initially but it doesn't mean that they're not intelligent and have valuable information to share yeah great alex Um, so first of all, I, somebody asked, uh, for my take on the action plan, which I posted, uh, which I think admins just deleted. <laughs> so don't, don't delete it when I post it again, please. It, it's me. Um, uh, unsustainable. So, so in my, in my, um, in my experience, uh, people, um, the, the kind of the default human state, um, is ignoring risk. It's not that some people are better at managing risk, some people are worse. It's our default human state, kind of, you know, um, evolutionally rebuilt is ignoring risk. And the second predominant force is self-serving bias. So, you know, executives, decision makers, uh, management, they're all uh, trying to um, uh, find the kind of least resistance way of uh, achieving their personal objectives. And uh, um, what this means is that you almost need to be ever present uh, for the risk culture to be sustainable, because literally the way you walk out of the room, and I mean, I had this so many times in the board meeting, um, uh, while you're there in the room, uh, everybody's risk that, risk this, risk that. And it's kind of funny, it's seen that uh, evolution when nobody talks about risk when you join the company within six months, they all talk about risk, but it's always kind of the wrong kind of risk. They basically misuse the term and uh, incorrectly apply it. And then, you know, a year later, everybody kind of talks about risk this and risk that. Um, but literally the way you walk out of the room or there's a new project or there's something at stake or somebody bonuses at stake, they'll forget about risk culture instantaneously. And, and so it's this uh, kind of ongoing exercise. And my solution was, you know, apart from creating those million small things, it's embedding uh, risk thinking into everything any template any uh, procedure um, any um, excel model that they build any requirement uh, there's basically it's always risk adjusted this risk adjusted that p90 p10 um, expected losses unexpected losses you know expected shortfall it's ev like it's, it's ever present and uh, i don't think it uh, solves fundamental problem of self-serving bias or human tendency to ignore risk um, but it certainly kind of acts as a constant reminder. Uh, for example, any kind of training that the business is doing, any kind of leadership training, any kind of new promotee training, there has to be a little module on risk-based decision-making. Um, not, not a risk management, like, for example, I wouldn't do a risk management training as a standalone exercise. I would just change it as, a, I would just offer it as a module in all the other training programs that HRs are running. That's why I, I, I love working with corporate universities um, in every company where I worked. We just basically rewrote parts of all of the existing you know, financial uh, literacy, management, leadership, uh, safety, all of these trainings that they, they now have like this uh, you know, sprinkling of risk-based thinking in that. So uh, in, my, in my experience, that kind of that helps to keep it sustainable. Lovely. Okay, there's a nice group of questions on sort of low risk maturity organizations. So how you how you go about this if you're in a company that really isn't very far along this journey and perhaps does little or no risk management. Um, so one person said, what are the key things to consider when implementing risk culture in an organization with a very low risk maturity, initial stages, preliminary stages? Um, somebody else asked something very similar. 
um, somebody asked what, about heat maps and whether, sorry, Alex, and whether they work in organizations where risk culture is not yet mature, you know, as a starting point. So, and, and you know, if you're starting from scratch, what do you do? So I'm going to come, Claire, to you first on this one, I think. Thinking about those organizations, because lots, I mean, lots of us work in organizations that, that are really good at this, but those organizations that do not do this, they don't do any of this, they don't have the, they don't have the building blocks for this. Where do you start then? Yeah, I think I'm going to give you an answer aside from the, what we've been saying a lot, which is like talk to people, know your business objectives, go ask people like what they think might impact that. Definitely talking to people is key, but maybe having a system in place, it, a lot, like I mentioned before, some people come to us with a framework first, they've spent a lot of time on that and now they need the system. If you are starting from scratch, there's nothing to say you can't get a system first. If you people have data, they have information on risks, and then you could use that to teach people as well. So, um, you know, bow tie as well as a model, you know, showing people that visually really helps people think about risk a lot better. So they can think about those causes and consequences. Use it as a way to really ask questions. When I'm training people internally, I do start with bow tie and I'll say, like, what do you think um, is a risk to this business objective? And we'll start with that in the middle and I won't disagree or agree. And we'll think about the causes that might happen to like events that might occur to cause that risk to occur and then we'll think about the consequences and as that happens people start to articulate the risks so much better um and i think you move things around that maybe the consequence is actually the risk to the organization and you get people to think about it and i think having those visuals as a first step is really great and just document document it don't don't lose it come back to people see what they've like thought about since you've had that initial conversation um, and just keep going. Just, yeah, it does as we said with that sustainability. Tom, um, low maturity, risk maturity organizations, where, where do they start? Yeah, so the, again, I think it depends, it depends on exactly what they're, they're asking in the question. Is it is it whether you've got um, low maturity of your risk management framework or low maturity of your risk culture? Um, and they are two distinct things, you know. So uh, you might have your risk management framework, but have a have a, um, a a poor risk culture because people don't embrace it. They're not transparent with you, you know, all, all these kind of things. So you know, if it's if it's um, if it's a risk management framework, then I agree with what Claire said. Effectively, um, run run workshops, identify your risks, identify your controls, get a solution. I do I do agree with having a solution. I think the smaller organisations might be able to work on spreadsheets, but. It, I think what that does is create silos and um, and doesn't necessarily um, allow the kind of interdepartmental relationships that you you, you need to be uh, need to be aware of and manage. Um, having it documented through a GRC solution as well is um, is really nice for kind of getting clear accountability. And you know you talk about tone from the top, have some really clear um, owners of those risks and, um, and visibility of that throughout the organization. Um, but in terms of risk culture as well, I mean, you know, start with a, start with a maturity assessment. Um, there's plenty of them out there. I think uh, Alex might shared one already actually, but like, there's lots of people out there who can provide it or um, or you can you can find one yourself as well. But you can be looking at things like, you know, your the responsiveness of people. You can be looking at the, the level of transparency um, or the, uh, the general sort of risk awareness and competence that they've got. So, you know, get, get out there and find a, um, a framework to to assess your organization against um, score against it and then that should really inform you of what you need to work on lovely alex low maturity organizations and do heat maps work in low risk maturity organizations yeah uh so, so double controversial then um um on 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 one side uh, um god what was the point i was trying to make uh, it just escaped me for a second. Um, uh, low maturity organizations. Okay, um, so uh, I, and I'm purposefully being contrarian. Uh, I I think the the risk culture is such a basic thing as a concept. Like uh, in all honesty, I don't understand why in 2023 we're still discussing this because it's it's as basic as it gets. Like the risk culture, there's no secret to risk culture. It's fundamentally a very simple sequence of. Uh, uh, parallel you know events uh, that needs to happen and um so number one i personally would never do a maturity assessment of risk culture and uh, i wouldn't waste time on that because we already know what the answer is regardless of whether you're mature or immature you already know what the answer is that there's literally like 15 things that you can do 
and you should do regardless of how mature or immature your organization is, how small or big. It, 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 none of this makes any difference. The, the 15 actions are not going to change. The, uh, the kind of the intricacies within the 15 uh, things may change and you know, there will be more mathematics, less mathematics. That's, that's not important. The, the fundamental things are not going to change. Change the way people make decisions, change the way people are remunerated, uh, change the way people are educated. Like these things are so fundamental and they're so basic that no matter what your maturity is, no matter what size your company is, no matter what country you're in, it's, it's always going to be the same thing. And literally the checklist that I've shared, it already gives you the, the answer of what you, what any organization on the planet needs to do. This is what I've been doing for the last uh, kind of five companies I've worked in. And it's kind of, it's always, uh, it's always the same. Some the, the maturity comes in, and some people get it quicker. Some people it, it takes longer. It takes uh, uh, quicker, but that's not important. The fifteen things they they, they don't change. They they're the same, uh, and, and so we already know the answer to risk culture. Like there's no mystery uh, uh, around risk culture, uh, and so uh, what uh, uh, answering the question what should immature companies do? Uh, they should do exactly the same as every other company on the planet. Literally, this these fifteen things, and it will just take you longer. And um, uh, and you know you shouldn't worry about that because you just you just do them at your own pace. Uh, and speaking of uh, risk cultures being used at um, uh, uh, immature companies, um, uh, uh, sorry, did I, he, using heat maps at immature companies, um, heat maps are the same things as horoscopes. They have no scientific uh, grounding. They have no practical usefulness. Um, so I mean you can literally use whatever you want. Like if you feel like using horoscopes for important multi-million dollar decisions, then it's up to you. I, I personally wouldn't and I, uh, and I try to avoid it in every uh, possible way. Uh, whenever I am forced uh, to uh, present risks on some sort of matrix, I do it um, expected shortfall, log normal of expected shortfall versus log normal of expected loss. Uh, which is a the kind of the only mathematically sound way of representing risks on some sort of uh, two-dimensional matrix, um, which is uh, not particularly useful uh, useful anyway. Um, so, so uh, but again, keep in mind that what I've said, I've said it specifically to be you know, more controversial than I need to be. <laughs> Tom, you look like you've got you're going to jump yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I, if I could come in, that's, and I, I, I get what you're saying, Alex, and I think there's some there's some good points in there. I think the uh, the maturity assessment, while I'm not a great adopter of it, um, I think in a in an organisation where you might not have as much clarity from some of your other stakeholders, the positioning of where you are within um, a, a maturity assessment model can be quite useful for, for framing it with some of those stakeholders. So it really depends, I think, on, on who you're working on, who who you're working with, um, what their understanding is. How you're going to influence them, and it, it may or may not be the right thing to do for your organisation. Um, on heat maps as well, I mean, like, I, I agree with you too. There's, there's lots of different ways to skin a cat on this one. Um, it's a nice visual tool. That's all. I mean, it, it works for some. Good. Okay. Sorry, I'm just looking. At, I'm just trying to take in all the questions. Um, I think. So there, there was one question. There, yeah. there was one question in the very, very beginning, and you know, we kind of skipped over it. But I think it's uh, it was a it, it was a very powerful question. So we might just maybe we'll come back to it. Um, and Which the question one is was, it? We can definitely come to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the question was, what does um, kind of successful or effective or good mature risk culture looks like for you? Like, what what's the what's the you know one simple indication? And uh, yes. So I was going to come on to measurement generally because that was my next question and there's a lot about that. But yes, there was something about, so one person said, this may not be the greatest example, but I feel risk culture in an organization is like air. You can't see it, you can't feel it, but you need it. So how do you improve it? And how do you measure, importantly, how do you measure the progress? And a lot of people have said, you know, you know, how do you, that you're doing this stuff, you're doing your actions, you're, you're influencing people, you're meeting with senior management, whatever it is that you, whatever specific actions you've decided to take to influence your risk culture, but how can you, how can you tell if it's working? Um, and there were a few other ones on that, but there are so many questions now, it's hard to, what is the best, do you have any suggestions about how to measure risk awareness within an organization? Like a few things about that, basically. Um, Claire, I feel like I haven't, it's you. Yeah, I think it's probably a harder one for me to state because 
I don't necessarily always see that end result um, in, in my role at Risk Connect. I'm sure a lot of my colleagues do and they support them with that. But um, when I was thinking about this, I think I thought about what indicators could you measure for yourselves with what you've already decided would be a positive risk culture? Like we're discussing on this panel and, and in the chat, you know, what risk culture is. And I think there is a clear interlink with your framework too. And, and you know, have you spread that message across your organisation? So once you've got an idea of what a positive risk culture will look like within your organisation, hopefully based on some things that have been supported in this in this talk today, what indicators could show you that that is working over time? So um, I thought of some examples, but I'm not necessarily sure whether they'll apply to all, but maybe like how many risks have you identified in your risk register that are linked to a business objective? Um, how much time, how many on-time assessments do you have? How many incidents are being raised? Like that might be more initially with a positive risk culture, not a negative thing, because you want that data coming through and you want people to be to raising those. Um, and then a number of identified emerging risks, for example, a number of issues. I mean, issues, uh, we might have different terminologies for, for what an issue is, but actually people raising issues to try and be more proactive about future events is a great thing and you know if you've got a compliance team member who sees a change in a regulation coming next year and they can raise that with the whole um organization or the, the key people that will be managing that issue what risk does that have an impact on what controls could we put in place to mitigate that before it happens that to me is a really good sign of not just a, a good framework but a risk culture because it means people are communicating with each other um, and supporting each other in their different areas so yes, to, to simplify, think of some um, indicators that you can maybe start to measure. And uh, some of them will come naturally, again, especially if you've got uh, an Excel model, I guess, with like totals or back to a system. I don't want to plug it too much <laughs> because it could be any system, but storing that data, uh, you could probably get some of those indicators without having to think about them too much or enter them manually in. Uh, Tom, what yeah, does... Yeah, you yeah, know what yeah. the question is. I know the question. I know the question. <laughs> um, so no, pretty similar. One of the things that's really visible, I think, is the is the sharing of information. And there's there's different ways that you, you see that information, isn't there? There's there's new risk being recorded on a on a risk register. Um, there's um, some of your um, your data points that might be around things like um, um, you know, it, it, it could even be things like um, like, like uh, your key risk indicators around things like uh, like disciplinary grievances and what's going on out there in the in the kind of wider risk culture of the business. But I think for me, it's more those kind of in the moment things that really tell me that the the risk culture is working. So it's it's someone's given me a call or someone's given one of my teams a call because they're they're thinking of doing something um, and they want to get a steer and they're doing it early. They're doing it at the right time. They're letting us be a, a commercial enabler. Um, and um, and showing that there's there's trust, which then again, you know, when you come back to those those key points of of a good risk culture around sort of perception and trust and awareness and all these kind of things, um, it, it means it's probably um, it's probably working. Alex, how do we measure success? What does success look like, indeed? Uh, I, I, so I love this question because uh, this is how I measure success. Uh, normally when I look at you know, other organizations other than my own. Um, if you open up any past board meeting materials and you look for significant multi-million dollar decisions or any big significant decisions, any budget approvals, any long-term contracts, any investment decisions, any you know, operational technical um, uh, decisions, and you look at the supporting documents, that was present like the, the memos, the presentations, the reports that supported that decision. And if you don't see proper in-depth risk analysis associated with that important decision, anything else that risk managers are doing is useless. It's basically, uh, if, if the organization continues to make decisions that are not supported by risk analysis, it doesn't matter how big your risk register is. It doesn't matter what you do, how many, how many trainings that you do. It basically, the risk management has failed. So to me, successful risk culture is the one where organization stops making deterministic uh, decisions, moves kind of in this stochastic uh, world, um, analyzes, not, not just presents a single alternative for approval, kind of yes, no, go, no, go, 
but presents alternative risk weighted alternatives and then uh, discusses that and challenges that and makes decisions based on proper risk analysis, uh, then that's uh, that, that's that's what a successful risk culture looks like. Um, everything else is risk management one, in, in my opinion. Who am I coming to next? Um, no, you've all done, okay. Um, I want to come back to this risk maturity thing a little bit. I've just read a few of the comments in the chat. And one of the things that people are saying is that, I'm trying to phrase it right. You know, there are some people like we are all very experienced with risk culture. You have all had long careers of improving risk culture in the organizations you have worked with. Not everybody has the same level or understanding of, of risk culture. So I think sometimes we talk about things as if they're really obvious, but perhaps they're not to everybody. So I guess with that in mind, like what let's bring it really back to the basics. What are the two or three things? What are the key things that people should be going away, having listened to us speak and doing to try and move the needle on risk culture in their organization? Whether that's understanding where they are in the first place, whether it's a specific action they could do, you know, where, bring it back to actual basics. What should people go and do next? Uh, Tom. Yeah, okay, sure. So um, I, I know we'll actually build on, on that. It's asked one as well, because I think it's a good one. Um, so, one of the things we're, we're trying to really focus on at the moment is um, is building in risk and compliance by design into into everything we do as well. So it, it comes to to that same sort of point. And I think that's a really great place to start as well because because as you're right, in many ways the sort of more general enterprise risk management risk 101 stuff is is a little retrospective in nature. Um, so if you can target those activities that are happening right now and and see you know what governance surrounds it right now that you can piggyback on, um, what, what's in there right now where you could um, make sure that you're getting some risk analysis before there's a sign up. You know? So those, that's your kind of your limiter um, so, that, uh, so that things don't necessarily go, uh, go awry, you don't get chaos. Um, I, I come back to the, the other point around building building relationships. You've got to do that, right? It, it is basic, but 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 do it. Um, so make sure you're doing that and respect them. And have a think about if there's anyone in your business you've been avoiding because they're more challenging. Um, and you know, it's, it's a human tendency um, to to do that. Um, so you know, think about those those people. Um, and is there anything else that I would uh, I'd recommend? I kind of I'll come back to that actually because I think those two are powerful points. Okay, uh, Alex. Um, so, so I think you've raised a very, very important point, is that um, we are saying fundamentally simple things. And like, for example, when I talk about you know, expected losses, expected shortfall, um, these things um, should be kind of the foundation of the terminology of risk managers. And yet the reality is 99% of the risk managers don't understand what I've just said. Um, and so my, I think the first step is to upgrade the risk management team itself, because when I, you know, e even when you read the, you know, the action plan that I've just shared, all of the actions in my mind are really, really simple. Because I understand when I say integrate into into an investment decision making, I know to me it means change assumptions to distributions, find the correlations, run the simulation, have an NPV, you know, distribution curve. To me, the kind of the the, the sequence of steps to implement that is really, really basic because. That's like the probability management 101. This is like university level uh, degree, but only if you ever studied probability management. If you've never studied that, to you, this is like all of this is meaningless. And it's the same with neuroscience, you know, neuroscience and behavioral economics. If you know nothing about cognitive biases and how humans make decisions under uncertainty, most of the things that we're discussing um, are meaningless to you. You don't, you don't appreciate the fact, for example, that you can't come in um, at 5 p.m. to a CFO's office and ask him about his opinion about what's the likelihood of you know, foreign exchange risk being a significant risk or what's the impact to put it on the heat map. You don't understand that there's actually enough science to suggest that you have zero chance of being successful in understanding the true nature of the risk if you do that, um, because it's uh, you know, late in the evening and it, these are the wrong questions to ask. Uh, and, and there's a lot of kind of there's a lot of science uh, science around that. So my my I think my biggest recommendation is um, upgrade your skills first before you're trying to kind of go uh, to the top management and trying to influence them into making better risk based decision making. 
And the skills are three things, probability management, uh, behavioral economics, and decision science. There are literally textbooks on each of the three things. These are the core fundamental skills uh, for you know, a risk professional, in my opinion, for any risk professional. Um, and once you know what decision science tells you about integrating uncertainty or risk analysis into decision making, then everything else kind of falls into places because it just becomes you know, really, really simple. Wow. Yeah, I kind of, I don't know if you want to repeat the question. I'll repeat the question as I understand it. No, so, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, ahead. go ahead, sir. I'll repeat the question. I, I guess it's, I guess it's, you know, bringing this really back to basics and, and assuming that perhaps there are people in the audience who aren't, you know, who haven't been risk managers for ages or who have never really done a risk culture transformation project or are thinking about it for the first time, perhaps. What are the key things they should do? What are the one or two things that they should really look at first? What are the, yeah. what are the bring it back to basics? What are the next steps? Yeah, I mean, again, I think there is two things here: is it's learning about risk management in general, not just a risk culture. Um, and like Alex said, you know, look, read, look into things. I can definitely recommend um, the the risk doctor David Tilson YouTube channel. There's a hundred risk questions. It's a whole series. The videos are like three to five minutes long each. And when I started out, I just watched those and I just found them so useful in starting from the very beginning um, with terminology that most people can understand. And I shared that internally with, with loads of new starters as well. Like I genuinely think that is the, the first starting point if you feel like you have any lack of understanding of especially terminology, that would be a, the, the key starting point. If you're further ahead, then again, it's just, again, a learning thing more than it is um, just related just to risk management. Just take the time to start from the beginning just to kind of get your head into it again. So you might understand some key points, but um, starting at the very beginning. So even if that means when you're talking to different team members, if you're new to an organization, you want to kind of see what the risk culture is like there, you know, ask to meet people that you might not have been told to meet. Um, meet the compliance team, meet the internal controls team, ask them what their definition of risk is and what they think they do to help like achieve the business objectives and just ask the really basic questions. I don't think you need to worry about sounding um, like you don't know what you're talking about in that scenario. In fact, I'd say that you do sound like you know what you're talking about because you're trying to build up uh, that risk knowledge um, across the organization and not just in one department. Lovely. Okay, we've got about four minutes left. So I'm going to ask you all to leave me with a final thought. Um, but it has to be a very short final thought because you've got four minutes between the three of you. So if and I'm going to Claire, I'm going to come straight back to you first. If you were to leave us with one final short thought, what would it be? Watch the Risk Doctor 100 Risk Questions video. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Alex, final thought. Um, I... I did uh, three years ago, I did a video, I did uh, maybe 50 videos, basically counter arguing every video that David Hilson did in his hundred videos. Um, so yeah, sure, watch David Hilson and then uh, watch my videos, basically giving you the full alternative, the complete uh, uh, 180 on everything he says. Just to be in the contact, kind of you know, broaden your horizon. So basically watch loads of stuff. I'm quite, I'm quite excited that there's all this YouTube risk and I don't disagree with what Alex said either. I mean, I'm not saying that like everything needs to be contradicted, but I think there are starting points. And then once you learn the sure. basics, you can enhance on that knowledge. Um, like it's really hard sometimes to understand a concept in risk management. There's a lot of method methodologies out there. Um, so even if you do change your mind on your view on risk, once you've watched more like content, that's fine. Um, but, you know, if you need a starting place, don't be afraid to just, you know, Google some definitions to terms and, and start there. Oh. Yeah, look, I'd say look, just, to, just to come to some of the points that um, it's, it's actually not that straightforward for some organisations at the same time. A lot of organisations don't need quantitative modelling or anything along those kind of natures. Uh, and, if, and if you find yourself in that situation, you know, you maybe be comfortable with that too. So don't be intimidated to get started. And, um, and definitely don't underestimate the value of the relationships that you've got in your business. Lovely. Um, so I want to thank all of our panellists who've been so interesting and so expert on all of this. I also want to really um, thank all of our attendees who've asked a load of really interesting questions that have 
helped shape this conversation and I think have been good. And also, if anybody hasn't looked in the chat, I really encourage you to do so because I've also noticed that quite a lot of our um, panelists have been posting about what they think risk, good risk culture looks like and some examples of what they do in their own organizations, which is also really valuable and interesting stuff. So it's great to have a lively debate. It's great to have such engaged panelists. And I've, I've really enjoyed the talk and I hope everybody else has too. Thank you. And Sarah, are you going to talk? Uh, are you going to turn the talk and the comments into an article? Yes, uh, the, we, the panel will be written up in our next issue. Everybody should read it. It's going to be amazing. Um, and we will also put it up online. So we will give it won't be as long as this panel because that would be a book. But we will we will write an article that gives a flavor of the most important dis points discussed here um, and some good, hopeful, hopefully practical instructions for risk managers who are at the beginning, middle or end of this journey. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.